Hey everyone, Micah here with ebikeschool.com, and today I'm coming back with another episode of the Which E-Bike Should I Get series. Now just as a reminder, I started this series back in April as a way to answer a lot of the questions that I'm getting via email with people saying, you know, this is my general situation and I'm wondering what e-bike you would recommend for me. I answer a lot of these emails, but they take a lot of time and I realize that I only really help one person with each email. So my goal with this series is to let you guys ask me questions and then I will answer them here in videos so everyone can see the types of e-bikes that I recommend for different situations. And hopefully you'll see a question that's similar to your situation. And if you don't, then make sure you stick around till the end of the video where I'll tell you how you can contact me and send me your question and hopefully I'll answer it in the next episode in this series. And just FYI, all of the bikes that I'll be talking about and mentioning in this video, I will link in the description down below so you can go check them out and compare the different bikes. All right, without further ado, let's get to the questions. First up, here's an email from Jackie who says she's wondering if the E-Cell Super Monarch is the best choice for a commute for her. It's about 12 miles one way, um, and she doesn't want to have to recharge at work, though it is a bit expensive, $3,400. Ouch, she says. She's looked at other cheaper bikes like the uh, Rad Power Rad Rover, um, but she doesn't want it to take so long to get to work. So she thinks the Super Monarch with its faster top speed gets up over 30 miles an hour, just FYI, that that'll get her there quicker. And then she's a little bit worried about the legal issues there. And, and lastly, questions about uh, e-bike theft. So there's a lot here. Uh, let's start with the bike. I have tested uh, multiple versions of the E-Cell Super Monarch. It's an awesome bike. The one she's talking about, the uh, $3,400, $3,500 bike, I believe that's the 1,000 watt model, so it's got two 500 watt motors. It is a ton of fun. It is a dual suspension, dual motor, dual battery e-bike with pedal assist and throttle. Basically, it's like two e-bikes in one. You get two of everything except one frame, and uh, it's, it's just a great e-bike. So if you're looking for a commuter e-bike that is gonna be comfortable and get you to work quickly, on a 24 mile round trip commute, this would definitely be a good bike. Looking at cheaper options like um, the Rad Rover from Rad Power Bikes, that's a great bike too, you know, I really like it, but 24 miles is, it's pushing the limit of its range without having to recharge. Also, if you're talking about trying to get to work quickly, having to ride around at 20 miles an hour or closer to 24, 25 miles an hour if you unlock the speed of the bike is not gonna be the quickest way to do it. The other thing is if you do unlock the higher speed on the Rad Rover, you're gonna get less range, so you might not make it to your 24, 25 mile round trip. So the Super Monarch uh, from e -Cell's definitely a bike that I would recommend. It's a bit pricey, but you're basically getting two e-bikes in one, so I think the, the price is fair for what you're getting, and it's got a lot of great components on it as well. In terms of the legal issue, yeah, most states do have limits of either 20 or 28 miles per hour, and technically, if you ride the Super Monarch in its highest speed format, you can exceed those limits. I'm not telling you to go out and you know break the law, but also in a 40 mile an hour speed limit zone, if you go 42, you're breaking the law. So I think that in keeping with the general spirit of the law, what I try to do is just not exceed the speed that is safe in areas. If I am riding a bike that's uh, a higher speed than the local e-bike, regulations. If I see a police officer, I slow down, uh, I mime pedal. You know, I just try to be respectful and I don't ride at unsafe speeds. But I don't think anyone's going to pull you over for riding a 32 mile per hour e-bike in an area where the limit is 28 miles per hour. Lastly, for theft, I'm actually planning on making a whole video on this, but the summary is use two locks. Use more than one lock. If you want to prevent your e-bike from being stolen, or at least do the best you can, use more than one lock of different types. Use a chain and a U-lock use a U-lock and a shackle lock, use just different types, multiple locks. That's the summary. All right, next, let's see. We have a question from Lee who says uh, he's thinking about buying a Frey HT1000 for commuting between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Do I think it's overkill? He was gonna go with a Rad Power Bike, but really wants to try the Bafang Ultra. Any thoughts? Yeah, I definitely have some thoughts on this one. First of all, I love Frey. Uh, I visited their factory last year. They're amazing salt of the earth people. They build awesome e-bikes with that Bafang Ultra Motor, which if you're not familiar with, I did make a video before, but the Bafang Ultra Motor gets up to 1.5 kilowatts of power. It is one of the most powerful mid-drive motors you can find on a retail e-bike. It's an awesome motor. So 
As much as I love Rad Power bikes, and you know, 750 watts is definitely enough for most people, if you want to go with a higher power setup, then the Bafang Ultra is going to get you there. When it comes to Bafang Ultra bikes, the HT1000 from Frey is one of the cheapest ways to get a Bafang Ultra. The bike starts at about $2,000, but it still comes with a lot of great components, uh, including those uh, Magura MT5E hydraulic disc brakes. Uh, I think it's got uh, I think it's the Shimano XT drivetrain, though I'm not positive, you have to look that up. And it is a hardtail, but it's got, um, you know, good RockShox uh, suspension fork. It's, it's basically a very good quality bike, but because you're not paying for that rear suspension, it's uh, a lot cheaper than Frey's other bikes. So it starts at 2000 bucks instead of starting at, I think it's like 3000 for the, um, uh, the Frey CC or closer to 4000 for the Frey EX. So I do highly recommend the uh, Frey HT1000 if you are looking to get into a uh, Bafang Ultra motor, but you don't want to pay for some of the more expensive versions, and if you don't mind not having rear suspension. There is another option now that's coming up. Saunders just released their Elite line of electric bicycles. They're not shipping yet, but um, those are Bafang Ultra powered bikes that are lower priced. So I think they start at either 2000 or 2500. I think there's a few different uh, bikes in that lineup. I wrote about it on Electrek, so um, I'll put a link below so you can go read that article, but that's another option. Uh, one thing that I should note though is that with Frey, the shipping does take longer. They're a smaller company based in Jinhua, China, and uh, they generally do either uh, air shipping, which I think takes about a month or so from the time you order till you get it because they produce the bikes as you order them, or they do sea shipping, which can take something like three months. Uh, so, and it's a little bit more expensive to do the uh, air shipping than the sea shipping. So look at the different options, but don't expect to, you know, decide you're gonna get a Frey bike and then have it the next week. It, it takes a little while. All right, next up we have a question from Gay, who says that she has to haul her regular bike up a flight of 20 exterior steps and she's getting a bit old for it. Uh, she doesn't want to give up biking though, and she says she would buy a wing bike if they weren't regarded as dangerous for older people. What? I've never heard of uh, wing bikes being dangerous for older people, but all right. Uh, she's looking at an Aerial M series, but um, she's heard reviews from women that claim it's too heavy to pick up from the ground. Just for reference, the M series weighs uh, 47 and a half pounds, so uh, that's sort of like her limit, I guess, here. And uh, your channel is great. It's my YouTube e-bike Bible. Oh, gay. Flattering me. All right, so uh, let's see. So if 47 and a half pounds is your limit and you want to stay under there and you're looking for a combination of the lightest and most powerful bike, we've got some serious constraints now. For one thing, light and powerful are inversely proportionate. If you want a more powerful bike, it's going to be heavier. And if you want a lighter bike, it's usually going to be lower powered. But we can try and find a nice balance there. To stay under 47 pounds or so, you're probably looking at folding e-bikes. I imagine you're probably on a full size, something like a 26 inch tire regular bike now, but for e-bikes, they get heavy and by moving to a folding bike, you get smaller frames, smaller wheels, smaller tires, everything's lighter. A couple that I might recommend checking out are uh, on the higher end, maybe a uh, Go Cycle GX. I know you said you wanted to stay under $1,700 and this is going to be fairly above that budget, but again, you're a little bit limited when it comes to um, lightweight, powerful e-bikes that you can still carry up a set of stairs. The Go Cycle GX is something like, I wanna say the low 3000s. It's, it's a bit expensive, it's a really nicely designed bike, and if you can swing it, it's definitely one that's just gonna be ultra portable. It's, uh, I wanna say something like 37 pounds or so, it's, it's very lightweight. But if we look at something on the other end of the price spectrum, I recently reviewed a bike called the Fido D11. And this one, at the time, it was on pre-order, so it was something like $700. Now it's probably closer to like eight, 900 bucks. But again, this is a under 40 pound folding bike. It's 20 inch wheels. It rides fairly well. I mean, it, it's a folding bike and it's got smaller wheels, so you are gonna feel a difference. But it still, it still felt good to me when I was riding it. It felt like a larger bike. It didn't feel like one of those dinky little 16 inch wheel uh, folding bikes. And this one is definitely gonna be easier for you to pick up, move around, carry upstairs. And because it's folding, you get that added benefit that when you bring it upstairs, you can fold it, stick it in the corner of your apartment, 
uh, put it under the desk at your office, that sort of thing. So another bike that I might look into, it's definitely within your price range and it's gonna be a lot easier to carry around than picking up some of those normally 50, 60 pound full-size e-bikes. All right, next up we have a question from Teresa who says she's new to the bike world. She's thinking of buying a folding e-bike for her commute and uh, her commute is less than two miles, so very short. It does have some hills, so she wants an e-bike and she's looking for a step-through sit-up bike, something with a more upright seating position and elegant looking is a plus. So she's looking at the Blix Vika Plus. Is that a good choice? Or a Rad Power uh, Mini Step-Through? Uh, let's see what else. Oh, and her budget is less than $2,000. So some good options here. Um, the Blix Vika Plus, it's definitely a more elegant bike. I really like that one. I enjoyed riding it. Um, there's nothing too special about it, you know, to ride home. It doesn't have, you know, hydraulic disc brakes. It doesn't have anything really fancy. It's just a nice looking, solid uh, electric bike. And if you're looking for sort of a more elegant looking bike, all of Blix's uh, bikes fit that. You know, the, I also tried their Avani. That's a great one, but it's not a folding bike. So if looks are important to you, Blix is a good option with that Vika Plus. Uh, talking about something a little sturdier, that Rad Mini Step Through is definitely a lot of fun. It's uh, also got a step through frame, but it's got those big uh, four inch fat tires, which means you can more easily take it on trails. I would cut through grass and parks and, and do all sorts of different riding on that bike that I couldn't do on the Blix Vika Plus. The downside is it's gonna be heavier, especially with those fat tires. It's surprising how much weight those add to bikes, but it's just a, it's a really fun option. It's a solid, well-built bike. Again, it doesn't have anything crazy special about it. There's no hydraulic disc brakes. It's got, you know, the low end Shimano transmission, that sort of stuff, but it's, it's well-made. You know, Rad is a uh, very large e-bike company. I think they're the largest in the US. They've got good customer support and people are very happy with them. So it's definitely a solid option. One other I might add to look at is the uh, Avani Cinch. It's another bike that I recently tested out and it falls into a sort of similar uh, class to the Rad Mini Step Through. It's not quite as step through. You do have to step a little higher over it, but it's another well-made bike. The frame is just beautifully welded. Uh, it's got nice parts, it's powerful. The one downside there is that the throttle doesn't work from zero, so you do have to start pedaling about one revolution before you get throttle support, which is one of the reasons I might choose the Rad Mini Step Through over it but it's another good option. One other bike I might recommend also is looking at the uh, electric XP step through. This is a great bike. It's 500 watts, um, 500 watt hours. It's really inexpensive at $899. So it's definitely within your budget. It's not quite as powerful as the um, Rad Mini step through, but it's got a lot of the same advantages with just some uh, slightly lower specs, you know, a little bit smaller battery, um, a little bit less power, but you save a lot of money. So another good one to look at. All right, next up we have a question from George. He says he's looking to spend between $1,200 to $1,500 for a 750 watt motor. He wants hydraulic disc brakes, good components, nice suspension. He wants to be able to ride in any terrain, asphalt, dirt, hills, trails. Um, he doesn't want to be riding hunched over like a mountain bike. He wants a more uh, comfortable seating position. Doesn't want it to be too heavy. He used to have a specialized road bike, uh, had a carbon frame, and he's wondering if it's worth the money for a carbon e-bike. All right, so a lot of constraints here. First, real quick, we'll talk about carbon. If all you're looking to do is recreational riding, probably carbon is not going to be necessary for you. If you're really pushing the limits and you're doing serious road e-biking or serious trail riding and you wanna shave off a few pounds, a carbon fiber frame can do that, but also, if you're talking about a price range of 1200 to 1500 bucks and the kind of components you're looking for, forget about carbon fiber. It's, it's not in the stars uh, for that budget. But we can still find some interesting things in that budget. It is a little bit tight, especially if you're looking for things like nice suspension and uh, hydraulic disc brakes. But I think it's doable, especially if you just kind of like float up the, the high end of that budget a tiny bit. For example, uh, so you said up to 1500 if you can stretch to $15.99, there is a great e-bike that I think you would like. It is the Aventon Level. This is basically a sort of hybrid bike and urban mountain bike, you might say, that can still do trail riding. It only has front suspension. It's a hard tail, so you don't have any rear suspension. 
but for 1500 bucks, you're not really gonna find a good full suspension e-bike with the kind of components you're looking for. You can find them, but they're gonna have cheaper brakes, cheaper transmission, cheaper saddle, cheaper everything. So the Aventon Level is a great bike for this price range because it's got those hydraulic disc brakes you're looking at, it's got nice components, um, it doesn't have that rear suspension like I said, but you can still do lots of riding on trails, you can uh, ride on the road, you can pretty much ride anywhere you want as long as you don't mind coming out of the saddle a little bit on the really tough stuff because you don't get that rear suspension. But it's just a nicely made bike. Um, again, Aventon, just beautiful welding. I'm just, every time I look at one of these bikes, I'm amazed at the welds. It looks like they just pulled the bike out of the ground like this in one solid piece. It's just a beautifully made bike. And this is one that I would highly recommend if you're looking for a bike that can sort of do everything in terms of terrain and still has nice parts, but the price stays down into the uh, 1500 and maybe up to 1599 price range. All right, lastly, we have a question from Frank who says he's looking for a bike in the $1,500 range. Uh, he wants to do some street riding, some mild off-road. Um, he's looking at the, uh, I think it's, he's talking about the Rad Rover from Rad Power Bikes. Um, but he says he wish it had nine speeds and hydraulic disc brakes. So the Rad Power Rad Rover, it's a wonderful bike. This one is a ton of fun. If you're looking for a $1,500 bike that will get you on those types of trails, it'll give you the power you're looking for, you really can't go wrong there. But if you're looking for something with more speeds and uh, hydraulic disc brakes, like you said, the next upgrade that I would probably recommend is moving to the Juiced Rip Current. This bike has a lot of the advantages of the Rad Rover. You know, it's got the uh, similar style frame, it's got the uh, fat tires, you can do the same types of riding, but it goes a little bit faster, it goes up to 28 miles an hour, it's got hydraulic disc brakes, it's got I can't remember if it's an eight or nine speed transmission, uh, but it's basically just got a few upgrades over the Rad Rover that'll probably give you what you're looking for if you're just looking for something that's a little bit more than the Rad Rover will give you. It does cost a few hundred bucks more, but it's it's got the parts you're looking for and I think that's the bike that is gonna make you happy. All right, so there we go. Those are all the questions I have for today. I hope you found something in there that helps you narrow down your search. But if you didn't, you can always contact me. Just shoot me an email at which ebike should I get at gmail.com. And hopefully I will select your question to feature in the next episode. Last but not least, it's time to announce the randomly selected commenter that will win a book from my last video. And the winner is... Tom Johnston. So congratulations, just let me know which one of my books you'd like. Either DIY Lithium Batteries, DIY Solar Power, the ultimate do-it-yourself e-bike guide or electric motorcycles and let me know where to send it. And anybody else who wants a chance to win one of my books for free, all you gotta do is put a comment down below. You can say anything you want. You can tell me what kind of bike you're looking for. You can tell me what the weather is, where you're living. Say anything you want and hopefully you'll be randomly selected at the end of my next video. And anybody who doesn't wanna wait that long for a chance to win one of my books, you can always find them on Amazon. All right, thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you here next time. <laughs>